Chad Kaser, State Conservationist for NRCS in Louisiana. Buenos tardes. It's great to be with you this afternoon. So I uh, just want to do a little introduction for the video. Uh, NOLO and the Mano Iola, uh group came to Southwest Louisiana a couple of weeks ago. Uh, beautiful day, perfect conditions uh, for a field day with one of our producers, Mr. David Daigle. And Mr. Daigle, uh, he owns uh, uh, a few hundred acres of forest and then leases uh, several hundred acres of forest here in Southwest Louisiana. And I would say Mr. Daigle is one of those uh, drivers and innovators. And he has been a, a driver in the reestablishment of uh, silvopasture and uh, recreating an ecosystem that uh, Louisiana had uh, hundreds of years ago, but that we were on the verge of uh, losing due to um, just solid stand uh, pine planting. And so uh, Mr. Daigle and Nolo and I are going to uh, you know, have a conversation with Mr. Daigle and talk about his operation and, uh, and some of his vision and then how he uh, is moving forward with uh, the practice, the conservation practice of silvopasture, which really is a, uh, a savanna-like or an open pine uh, stand with, uh, with grasses, mostly native grasses uh, underneath, and then uh, allowing uh, cows to, to, to graze on that grass. And the, the, the change in uh, the ecosystem, and really it's the soils and the soil health that, uh, that really start to improve and, and how having a grazing animal, uh, in this case, the cow, uh, back into the ecosystem like we would have had buffalo uh, you know, hundreds of years ago, that that is really a recreation of, of what that natural system was. Uh, and you know we're we're reinstituting uh, prescribed burning, so we have uh, uh, the match and the hoof to uh, to recreate the natural settings that we had hundreds of years ago, and really uh, reinvigorate the longleaf pine forest in in Southwest uh, Louisiana. And he's a he's an example, and uh, and and we love to showcase uh, his operation because that's. Uh, that's some place that we would like other producers to uh, to uh, have a vision of how they can improve their uh, their forest land and and also then provide some alternative uh, income while you're you know while you're growing these trees while you've got those trees in production and uh, and we'll we'll see how his operation uh, works and see his uh, uh, vision. And it's a very interesting uh, uh, interview. So Nolo, I'm gonna stop there and turn it back to you. Um, thank you, and, and it was an outstanding day and thank you for facilitating that. First, we will show a video from the Louisiana Grazing Lands Conservation, which has outstanding pictures and explanation of, of the civil pasture. And then we're gonna go into that conversation that Chad just described. So hope you enjoy it. I'm David Ryan Daigle, and I grow cattle and timber in the longleaf pine flatwoods region of southwest Louisiana. And uh, we're on the St. Gabriel track of the Daigle Farms, and one of seven tracks that we manage for longleaf pines, uh, four of which have cattle herds on them, distinct cattle herds. We use prescribed fire and herbivory from the cattle, so we biomimic natural forces to maintain our longleaf pine system to be an open park-like uh, grassland with tree zone. We've been doing this work since 1982, and uh, so it's pretty much been a, a working lifetime thing. Hi, Chad Kaser, State Conservationist for the Natural Resources Conservation Service, stationed in Louisiana. So I've been uh, with NRCS for 20 years now, and working with producers like Mr. Daigle. And it is always exciting uh, to see someone that has such a passion for the land, 
such a passion for conservation and is such an innovator in his field. And it's just exciting to be able to be out here with uh, with him today and, and listen to him talk about his land and, and the work that he's doing to restore this native prairie ecosystem. It's uh, it's always enjoyable, and we always want to try to bring that message to the rest of uh, the rest of our producers in the country. I'm Rick Williams. I'm the Natural Resource Conservation Service State Forester for Louisiana. Um, work out of Alexandria, Louisiana, our state office, but I service the the whole state, assist the parishes with their forestry uh, trainings and opportunities. Uh, around the state, and uh, been doing this here for 12 years, and uh, it's a really good job. And helping people is what I like to do. Nalo Martinez, co-president of Manayola. So we are here at Dave's farm. We're obviously highlighting uh, farmers that have innovation and have tried a number of different. Uh, things. In this case, we're doing a field demonstration on silver pasture in the southwest region of Louisiana. This type of thing that we're doing here was researched by U.S. Forest Service uh, uh, up at Katachi National Forest. And, mm-hmm. And one of the early leaders in that was a man named Dr. Henry Pearson up there at Glenmore, south of Alexandria, on the Southern Research Station. And But I met him at a Longleaf Pine planning meeting, and he gave me a compilation of all the research he had done over his life. And in the front was, you know, cattle, timber, wildlife, watershed. Mm-hmm. So... You know, they were thinking multi-use in those days is the word they used. Now we think maybe a little deeper into it as integrated, you know, natural resource management. Holistic. It's like, this is special. I don't want to change it, mm-hmm. but I want the values of it, you know, be they you know, financial values or recreational values, or cultural values, and so forth. Yeah. So, the key to that holistic thing, in my mind, and, you know, as, as I've developed things along the way, is that, number one, economically, checks come from different places, mm-hmm. you know. So, we obviously don't sell timber every year, but, you know, the cattle... The cattle crops are there. And uh, so, uh, you know, there are, and in hunt leases, have essentially more than tripled. Uh, as this country went away from free range in about 1992, to now the, the recreational leases have tripled mm-hmm. plus, and we see a even bigger demand for that. So, um, so income sources from different places, and in integrated resource management, holistic thinking. You don't use any one of these resources at the detriment of anything else. So this creation here is natural. It's a blessing to be able to work on it. And uh, I don't want to just run cattle here. And if I do, I will overgraze my plant community and lose the biodiversity. I don't want to run, I don't want to grow just trees because if I do, I won't have any sunlight on the ground, and I won't have any forage, and so forth. So, no specific value or use should diminish another value or use. And that's complicated, mm-hmm. but it's complicated. But if you go back to the natural forces of things, 
how things were naturally because this is much like what the early explorers described this place as, you know, in the 1700s. If you go back to why was it that way, there were natural fires, Native Americans were burning, and there were grazing animals. So, you know, that's kind of our guide. We can manage those two natural forces very economically with, with low influence right? and, and in productivity from it. So as we go forward, you know, we now have 140 mama cows, and and I, it's kind of a joke, but I tell people, I say I'm I'm raising organic beef as an unintended consequence because what we're doing, we're managing those cattle. We give them a lot of land, cow for 15, cow for 20 acres each. We rotate them. We keep tall plant communities. Our cattle don't have worm problems. They don't have they're acclimated to make it in this system. They don't have cabin problems. They don't have feet problems. They don't have eye problems. And so uh, we're we're um, we're managing it in a in a natural way. In the, and I had a point, and I can't remember where it was. <laughs> I was going somewhere. With you. Well, it started with the concept of not necessarily looking back at the way it was. Right. So. Where the value, I think, will come now in managing these sites, and it, it, you know, and I have some young guys working for me, and they're going to be partnering with me, is where is the added value? You know, so, you know, we're doing okay selling calf crops, and, you know, when you have some people that select from bulls, you know, but we're not really a seed crop producer, but but where is that added value? You know, should we start processing some of these animals and go into a local market? Be it organic, grass-fed, or just plain natural? Should we feed them six weeks, you know, and then process them through the system? The same way with this timber. This, this particular type of timber doesn't lend itself well to the industrial model of the tree farm, but a lot of this timber mimics the virgin pine quality of lumber that came, which is a very tight grain, very dense, very, very uh, heavy, uh, very strong wood. And it, it, some of it is really, really beautiful, like you know, 10 and 15 and 20 rings per inch. So they grow slow. We could move that to specialty products like beans or flooring or um, or different kinds of things through more of a local type market. The other thing this system has on an industrial model is, particularly on this stand over here, you see a lot of those trees are formed just right for utility poles. Oh, yeah. So it's a specialty product going into the industrial system and, and, uh, and it's the taper and so forth. So but in terms of outstanding natural resources, so to speak, when you talk about carbon sequestration, we know that when we graze this stuff right, we're, we're increasing soil health, which is probably, probably stored more carbon in the soil. Uh, we don't have the numbers yet, but we know we do. But a lonely pine, you know, stores a lot of carbon within it. It's, mm -hmm. it's a rich resin filled wood. And, you know, when we use fat pine to, you know, to start the fire at the camp, you know, and that kind of stuff. So, you know, I think there's a lot of sequestered carbon sequestration that's going on in this system. And we never break the ground. You know, we, we, uh, we just, you know, we just use it as it is and it maintains itself pretty well. So pollinators, is another thing. There's three research projects going on on this particular track right now, and uh, and one of them is pollinators and bees and stuff. So, when we were talking about that on the way over, that you know, in our in our tame pasture systems, we've lost the pollinator, 
and you can see, you know, you can see the pollinators around you and behind you. Uh, you know, and you talked about the plant diversity. Mm-hmm. Well, here it is, uh, the end of September and you've got flowering plants. Mm-hmm. You've got flowering plants, you know, in the early season, the mid season, the late season. So you're, you're feeding your pollinators all year round. Mm-hmm. Um, we were talking about last week that South Louisiana is some of the last stopover for migrating birds. And, uh, and for a bird that's going to go from here to, uh, Mexico or South America for the winter, if they fly straight across the Gulf, they've got a 24 to a 36 hour straight flight. There is no place for them to rest. Mm-hmm. And so they need to fuel up. And so you're providing a fuel source for those migrating birds. You're providing, you know, the pollinator mm-hmm. habitat for those, you know, pollinators to, to start wintering. Mm-hmm. Uh, with your grazing system, you've got capacity to withstand dry spells. Mm-hmm. Right. So by grazing fewer cows, you've got grass in the bank that, you know, if it does turn off dry, you've still got grass that's available. Your your time to destocking is a lot different than a producer that's, uh, that's grazing just on the production that's happening right then. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got fuel. Mm-hmm. You've got to always be thinking of uh, the fuel for that next prescribed burn mm-hmm. and maintaining a fuel load. So that you can burn this coming winter, and, and where are you going to burn? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of that thought concept. You talked about your soil health, the biodiversity, you know, in the soil health, and all the microbes and and all the things that are going on in the soil mm-hmm. to feed all the plants and how they interact with each other. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's a it's a very complex system that you you know that you're working with here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just getting to look at it from a below the ground viewpoint, and you know, from a from an overall, you know, holistically, there's a lot we don't know. Mm-hmm. For example, when we were, we have some protected land that we, you know, we have a conservation servitude on, and we can't graze it. So we felt that to maintain the system we were observing, that we need to graze it because it. It helps with our native brush, keeps the brush down. Mm-hmm. And then we learned from the soil health gurus that that was tied to soil health and nutrient cycling. Mm-hmm. That a grassland on the prairies, most of the prairies all over the world, the brush stays down because of nutrient cycling in the soil and the grazing animal impacts the nutrient cycling. Mm-hmm. So what we did, we measured soil health as good as we could at the time at a grave site and an ungrave site. And what stuck out was microbially active carbon on our grave site, which means uh, the scientists at the time called it the flywheel. Mm. Was you are cycling more nutrients here mm-hmm. than on a, on a non-grave site. The other thing is this site will stay greener longer through the year because we prune the top of the grass mm-hmm. off. So it's constantly regrowing. In some of our non grazed sites, the grass is finessed, so mm-hmm. to speak. So everything kind of gets quiet. So we're not, we're not on those on sites. So we're not, we're not, uh, you know, we're not harvesting as much sunlight. It's, it's not as much sunlight is flowing through the mm-hmm. system. So, yeah, it's um, and and ideally for animal health, we like our cattle to just just eat about the top third of of, um, of the bunch grass that's there, mm-hmm. which is the most nutritious, right? And then we move them on to the new pasture. So the yeah, you know, the grass comes back faster when you only take the top the third or the top half. Yeah, you know, our right. our philosophy is take half, leave half. Right. And right. yeah, the grass comes back much stronger, and it doesn't have to stop growing roots to regrow leaves. Exactly. It's like taking the top third or top half. Root function never stops. Mm-hmm. So what do we do in that? Constant root structure function, that constant root function through the year is increasing soil health. Mm-hmm. 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 
Nellos, we've always got producers that are uh, that are at, at every scale of, of adoption. And, you know, Mr. Dave is uh, obviously a, an early adopter. And, uh, you know, and, and we'd love to, uh, to bring other people out to, to showcase this and, and yeah. show them the potential because sometimes you don't know what you can do until you see what someone else has been able to do. And so you can't realize those possibilities. And everybody's got their own, um, their own abilities, their own, uh, land, you know, uh, tenure. You know, whether it's lease land, own land, um, you know, the, the prospects. They think of a, uh, a 50 year lifespan or, or longer of a long leaf pine. And so that's an entire lifetime that, you know, right. that they don't see the possibility of it. Right. So, you know, we're always, we're always in that, in that stage of trying to move somebody from where they are. better job of grazing your pasture. If you've got a uh, long leaf or short leaf or loblolly or, you know, we want you to do a better job of managing the forest. And can you, can you get to this point? Is that within your structure? Like we were talking about earlier, you may not, uh, you may not want to have livestock. You know, livestock may be something that's outside of your area of expertise and you don't want to get into trying to buy and handle and sell and uh, medicate and, you know, and do all those things. That's that you, right. And so, uh, but back to the thought process of, you know, this is fantastic habitat for deer, quail, turkey. It's fantastic birding habitat, right? How could we integrate this into a, you know, a birding trail or a, uh, a wildflower uh, trail or, you know, a hummingbird trail? You know, how could we... You know, how can we utilize, you talked about earlier about the clean water, you know, that this system produces water that's clean and filtered. It's gone through all of this grass. It's gone through, the, you know, a healthy soil. And so you've got clean water that comes off of this. We keep talking about uh, ecosystem payments, right, that there's incentives for yes. providing, you know, clean water. And there are, there are parts of the country that, uh, that really value and need to maintain a forest situation in a watershed so that the water that drains into that uh, drinking water lake or that drinking water aquifer is clean and filtered. And so those cities are, are willing to pay a producer to help maintain uh, a property like this. And so there's lots of possibilities, and we always want to try to help get somebody from where they are to just a better, you know, a better system. Utilize the, the, you know, utilize the, whether it's the grass or the trees or the, or the cropland, wherever you're at, use it better so that we can send it into the future better than we found it. Well, the first thing we look at is, is all that understory right. that we have to get rid of. And we have practices to do that. You can do shredders, you can do spraying, then you can burn it. You know, it's going to take some time to get some control, uh, a little patience. Yeah. Uh, but when I look at that, I can see this yeah. in my mind. So I know where we're going. And it's, you need to explain that to the producer so they're comfortable with that uh, in your decisions and stuff and what it's going to take to get there. So one, they have realistic expectations. Right. But they don't think tomorrow my land's going to look like this. They need Correct. realistic expectations of what it's going to take to move that. But it can easily be done uh, to move a forest like this to one like this, or whatever their objectives may be. And we would recommend the practices to get there. You know, what it would take to, to convert this to this. And and uh, even if you just wanted to grow long leaf pine, that really needs to be taken care of, even if you didn't have a cow. Because if we had a wildfire and a drought, so your neighbors in the West that have let the understory get like this, when that's dry, look at the flame height. They're 20 and 30 feet tall, which is a ladder right to the ground. Mm -hmm. So the fire can go right out the top. When you look at this side, where the grasses are, 
and you get dry, your, your flame height four or five feet, and it doesn't reach the ground. And so it's easier to stop the wildfire here if we didn't want the burn going because of the fuel that's here. As opposed, you couldn't put somebody in here. There might be a You just have to wait till it comes out the other side. Yeah. So wildfire reduction, demo cattle, the wildlife habitat value, and growing longleaf pine. Yeah. Longleaf pine regenerates. It's, it's an intolerant tree. That means it regenerates in sunlight. So a seed falls out here. It's got sunlight. It can it can turn and grow. The seed that falls in here, and you got crown opening. There's gaps. If the seed falls out here and starts trying to grow into that, maybe survive a year and it's gone. So you can't get the regeneration. You can't get that sustainable natural forest flow because the conditions aren't right. So one which assessing your conditions, what's on your ground, what we can do to help, does that fit your goal, and then we can work you through the program and then start implementing yeah. to get those things done. And like David mentioned earlier, lonely pine is a uh, it's a denser wood. The specific gravity of lonely pine is heavier than the other southern pines. So you can make flooring out of lonely pine. They don't out of the other one. Uh, a higher proportion of lonely can make a telephone pole than the other one because they got small branches, very, you know, fewer branches, and the trees grow nice and straight. Yeah. So your percentage, so in the value standpoint, you can grow more high value product than you can with the other pines. Not that they don't occur there, but I'm talking about percentages. So just from here, you know, you've got some saw logs. So you've got some value in the saw logs. They've got probably some poles in there. There's no regeneration. You know, so this person may be looking, I'm going to cut that and make it a pasture. I'm going to cut that and replant it. you still got to deal with all this. Yeah. This stuff's not going away until you treat it. No matter if you're going to a pasture, if you're going to grow trees, if you're going to replant it. Or if you want to manage this natural system. Mm -hmm. well, that's your first problem that you have to deal with. Yeah. And it's not good forage. Uh, wax myrtle. Uh, there's some oaks they would nibble on. Uh, some invasive trees that just moved in here. Uh, Chinese tallow was terrible down in South Louisiana. Across Louisiana mostly. So we got to deal with this. And then we could make them a, a healthier forage. So we improve forest health. We reduce the wildfire risk of losing this. Uh -huh. And, and then they're going to get more Diversity in their forest is going to make it uh, more enjoyable for them to use it. The clear contrast of, of a managed, yeah. and it's taken a while, but a managed system and an unmanaged system. Yeah. You know, one that you just let nature do its thing. Right. And if fire was taken out of this and the cattle were taken out of this, you come back here in five years, and you're going to have this. Yeah. Those things are going to come. I mean, the little remnants are here. Right. So they're going to be allowed to grow and develop. And then you start losing your forbs and your grasses. Right. And really the valuable plants that are in place, they're there. Yeah. Yeah. The seeds are in that soil. You don't have to do anything except give them the conditions to grow. Right. They're there. And Rick, tell me a little bit about your experience and you were when you started to now. I know that this is more and more accepted and embraced by many of the local producers. Uh, was that transition easy? When did that begin? Uh, not a lot of people are managing this natural system. Okay. Uh, and the natural system really has a lot of intricacies to it. There's a lot of art with the science, and, and uh, most people, private landowners, glance over at what industry's doing, oh. and they think, "Oh, that's what we need to do." So we need to we need to plant loblollies in rows, and, and so that's the first thing. So we always want to talk to them about the, the natural plant, the right tree on the right place. 
with short leaves or long leaves. Uh, get the right tree growing where it should be growing. And it's healthier for your forest. Uh, and you can see the hurricane came through here. And the good thing about this natural system, multiple age classes. So if a producer lost an age class, there's still other age classes here. It's, it's back going a lot quicker than if you had just an ocean of little pine plantation and it all got blew down. You start from scratch. In this natural system, you can take care of those few trees that are blown down, uh, that one age class, and the other ones are already growing, they're already in place, and they can, they can utilize the cycle. You want to, um, you know, one is to see what's out there that's available, and uh, land prices are going to be, you're going to have to check, <laughs> but there's always a good deal, and I just wish I had the opportunity to go back and get some of those deals that I saw go by, uh, but you want to get one that, that has the opportunity to help pay for itself, got some trees on it, something to work with. Or it's in a the price wise that you could implement some of the practices and and uh, start generating some income from it. Uh, so you really just need to research the area, find one that has some access mm -hmm. that you can get to and work with. And uh, how close is water, or is there water in that you can get from a well? Uh, so just you know the other things that you might need to operate a, a system on that. You know, where it's located. Are there markets to move your animals to if you want animals or the forest product? Pretty much across the state, we can move salt timber. Some parts of the state, we have trouble moving the little wood, the pulp wood size wood. Uh, we have some new pellet mills. Mm -hmm. They'll take the little stuff. There's a few pulp mills, but uh, Jonesville High middle of the state. Mansfield up towards Shreveport. Um, so it's going to depend on the location you're at to move the small wood. Yeah. Once you have the trees in the ground and they're growing, they're putting value on it. Even if I never cut them. I'm on my own land. I won't see the trees harvested. They're 12 years old. But they're there and they're adding value. Yeah. And they're adding all kind of other benefits to that property that I might not see the end products. Now, in my mind, I can see them. I know it's going to happen. <clears throat> my grandkids can use. Couldn't be there for them. Sure, sure. Yeah, they're going to have good products to move. I appreciate Mr. Daigle for allowing us to uh, to come out and uh, and see his property and and talk to him about his operation. And you know, I hope that uh, that it gives. I guess some. Uh, uh, some possibilities and some uh, opportunities for people to, you know, to to want to improve their land or or start, you know, a particular type of operation, uh, you know, and you may not be able to recreate this exact um, type of operation in in your location where you're at today, but you have to start somewhere, and you can get somewhere from here, but you have to start. And, you know, the old saying of uh, when was the best time to plant, a, or when's the best time to plant a tree? Well, 30 years ago was the best time to plant a tree, but we don't have that. So today, you know, we have to start from where we're at today. And, and that's where I want to encourage uh, producers to uh, contact their local NRCS office, uh, ask them for, you know, a conservation plan. You know, how can we, uh, how can we, the NRCS, help you, the producer, achieve the goals that you want to achieve. And, and a conservation plan will help you uh, take those steps from where you're at today to, you know, to where you want to be. And it may take 10, 15, 20 years to get there, but you have to know the steps and, and what order to do things. And, and like Mr. Rick was talking about, uh, the, the practices to reduce that understory uh, in that property that was next door that was not as well managed as uh, uh, as Mr. Daigle's property was. You know, you have to start 
and it takes time and uh, and trees grow so slow it seems like in the in the early stages you know that uh it, it seems like you'll never get that harvestable tree but then all of a sudden just like the rest of us uh you know it's it's 10 years later it's 20 years later it's 30 years later and uh and if you've been doing all those management practices uh for those 10 20 years then then you're going to get to where you want to go and that's the you know that's the message is you know contact NRCS, uh, work with our office, get a conservation plan, a forestry management plan, uh, get, you know, get on the path to, uh, to where you want your property uh, and, you know, to go and what you want your property to look like and, and how you can manage the operation with, with the tools that you have. Chad, I also wanted to tell the audience and to uh, take advantage of this opportunity to thank you for a couple of things. One of the things that we wanted to do was to have a field day at the farm. Mm -hmm. And we thought about that possibility and bring folks, which I know we will be able to do, but in order to have it done and at least uh, bring in a virtual setting, uh, the reality of, of, of what is possible and what they're doing. So I thank you for accommodating us to that reality. I also know, uh, and we share with many that we're starting just last week, this week, uh, officially working on forestry outreach. So mm -hmm. I know that we will be able to use your expertise and many of these farmers to bring uh, bilingual uh, opportunities and uh, field days so folks can actually see it because it makes a very very big different uh, difference to for people to see it so thank you chat for being so um, um, open and, and so kind to 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 this work and, and helping us learn as well so thank you very much a pleasure